Wheelhouse DNA. You know how people talk about what separates humans from animals and most of it is consciousness and opposable thumbs, you know? Like, the, the human ability to remember one another is to me one of the great gifts of being a human being. And not letting someone be forgotten is part of the magic of consciousness that we're somehow graced with as human beings. From Wheelhouse DNA and Acast, this is Comfort Food, a show about life, loss, grief, celebration, and the meals that support us through it all. I'm your host, Kelly Rizzo. Today we have a very special episode. With the two-year anniversary of the passing of my late husband, Bob, I thought a lot about what guest I wanted on the show who would be a perfect person to talk to during this time. And the answer was very clear. He was totally instrumental in being there for me in the early days of losing Bob. He's a dear, dear friend. And of course, he's a brilliant musician. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Mayer. John. Tell me when we start. We're going to start now. Was that a cold open? This is a cold open. Are we already, have we already started? We're starting now. We may have already started. We may have. I leave it to you. Okay. I am so, so happy you are here. This really means so much to me. And what I'm about to say might get a little upset with me because you're very humble about this. But we are coming up on the two-year anniversary of Bob. And there is no way I could have gotten through these last two years in the way that I have without you. And... You have shown up in such a massive way that only you could have done. There's no one else that could have done what you've done in these last two years for me, for Bob's girls, and most importantly for Bob. And I will be forever grateful to you for that. So thank you, thank you. And I know you're very humble about the things that you've done, but um, thank you. Well, but people should know that you are just a magnificent, wonderful friend, and I'm forever you. grateful for you. Thank you. I'm grateful for you and. And, you know, it's hard to say that it's all just for Bob because I really do adore you and, and I've come to love you even as your own person, you know. Thank you. And uh, maybe I have a meeting place where Bob and I meet you know, in my mind. Mm-hmm. And maybe that meeting place is the table at Craig's. And he's right across from me at Craig's. And that's our meeting place. And, and he just tells me to take care of you. Nervously, nervously neurotically begging me to make sure you're okay. You, you, know, you know how he would say that. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, 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 please just take care of Kelly. Please. I'm, and I'm so sorry. You, sh- you have so much to do already, but please. And I go, I got it. I told you this before. I yeah. Go, I got it. I got it. I want to know something that you might not remember, but the day after Bob passed, because, you know, we were all in community yeah. at my house for days. Um, and my sister and my mom were at a table with you and you were talking to them. And you mentioned that day, you said, I know that Bob is telling me in some way, take care of Kelly. Yeah. And you did that. And one thing I know you're also very humble about, but I'll, you know, because I've never said this publicly really, but you literally, like that week, I was so sick. I was so physically sick that you truly did things that week that I'm, guaranteeing saved my life because (laughs) you sent me an IV doctor. You sent me a real doctor to the house. You did so many things that you were just, that most people couldn't just orchestrate in two seconds that you handled. And, you know, I'm once again, that was the hardest week of my life. And because you were there holding all of our hands through it, you really got us through it. Thank you. Uh, My coping is taking care of, Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting better at taking care, like giving care. But my original coping thing is taking care of it. Mm-hmm. You know, get it done, get it done, get it done. And you know, that's what Bob did. Really? Well, he, was a, he, he, was a, he, he was a take care of it guy. He was a, you have a problem, I'm going to fix it. I got a guy. Yeah. You know, he, everything was, I got, you know, I got a guy yeah. for that. I mean, as you get older, the metric of your success has less to do with money Less to do with automobiles, less to do with homes, and more to do with how quickly could you help somebody in a jam. And it's that I know a guy thing. And that also is an expression of how your relationships with people are. How when the, when, when the phone rings and it has your name on it, who will pick up and say, oh, it's John. How can I help? You know, there's all, it's actually a really good metaphor for living 
your life really well is who would be there to help you when you extend a, you know, you need a favor for a friend, you know, and, and right. I, I'm pretty, I mean, also You're, this was Bob, you know, I mean, everybody loves and loved Bob. So you mention Bob to someone, they're going to, they're going to move mountains. You know? So you're saying that after time and the older you get, it's not the things you have, it's the people you know and the help you can provide and How the can services, you help? like yeah. more services versus things. Yes, that's right. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> like I tell you, I'm, I've never told anyone this. I want, people don't think I want to be married. I absolutely want to be married. I know that, yeah. I, you, you, secret, you know the secret, which is that I'm actually fairly well-adjusted considering what's happened to me in my life. Pretty yeah. well-adjusted and, and, and ready, to, ready to go at any moment. And I so badly want to get married if only for my wife to just know in her heart, like John will know what to do. I just think that level of being relied on is the hottest thing in the world. Like to me, like it's like if my husband was here, he would know what to do. Call John, call my husband. I just think, and by the way, this- That means this you're a me. caretaker at heart. You're a caretaker. You're a full grown up when this is your, when this is your romantic fantasy. You're a fully fledged grown up. Your, your kink is that you want somebody to be like, John's got a guy. Reliance kink? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Dependability <laughs> kink? Yes. Someone to say, uh, um, call John, he'll know. Oh, well, ladies, <laughs> if you need somebody to, yes. uh, if, if you need a, you know, car fixed or a yes. doctor or whatever, yes. and you need a guy to orchestrate a concierge yes. that can put this all together, John's your guy. Well, well for, for those, yeah. for those I love, absolutely. Absolutely. So what's interesting to me is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you even being, you know, we're both in our 40s now. And if I'm not speaking for both of us, let me know. But you had, Bob was the closest person that you had lost up until that point. Isn't that true? Aside oh, from, yeah. Oh, yeah. aside from grandparents or something like that. I mean, that. I've had, I've had peers in the music industry right. that have passed away. But Bob's passing was the first veil being taken off from over my eyes and seeing loss in that deep way that you can only see if you've experienced it. He just pulled this veil up. I, it was in good, good work when you can keep it, you know, over your, over your eyes for as long as you can, may you not understand, you know, right. may you, and I went a very long time. I was actually very lucky to have gone as long as I had without understanding. That's what I'm saying. That that's, I was very that's, lucky. Yeah, I, was I mean, lucky. same for both of us. Yeah. And, and so that means that Bob was your first real loss as well. Yeah, aside from grandparents. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like I was saying, you expect people to die in order. Right. You know, and you can, you can sort of keep an eye on the people who are the oldest in your life. And you work on this slow level of acceptance. You begin to prepare yourself. You start running these little practices in your mind. When it's your grandparents, or, you know, in the case of my dad, who's 96, you run little dry runs. Yeah. What would it be like? Oh, okay. You start limbering up a little bit. Okay. And, and what you don't expect is for someone who's 65, who you expect to see day who after seems day, like year after year. He's 55. Who seems like he's 55 right. and really vital and has a relationship with the world that seems to suggest they will, he will always be in the world. That was pivotal in my life. It was pivotal because what happened is it was like I got on an elevator and the doors opened up and I made it to a new floor. And that floor was everyone in my life who had also lost somebody who you can't see unless you lose someone. They won't out themselves. They won't introduce themselves as a fellow Whoa. loss member until you lose someone. And you'll say, they'll reach out to you. And the ones you know have lost people already are really good at communicating sympathy. They're yes. really good at communicating with you. They don't say the boilerplate thing. They kind of know. You can tell who's you can kind of tell. been through it and who hasn't by whether they use a canned response or not. I never understood may his memory be a blessing. I never got it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? How did you feel when people wrote, may his memory be a blessing? I liked that more than some of the more 
generic responses. What, what's the most generic symp- sympathy response that you I'm got? I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah. I guess. Which is fine. It it's is fine. fine. Because people, it, it really does choke people up. It's like people don't know what to say in those situations, but they know they have to. And it's very uncomfortable to have to put into words this thing that's bigger than words. And so when I sort of introduced myself to people as someone who had just lost this dear, dear friend in my life, they introduced to me that they had been a member of that club. And they would almost let you know when they had joined the club. They would say, I lost my mother, October of 20. And you'd go, I didn't know that. You know, and everybody will tell you. They'll, They'll let you almost know when they became a member, you know? It really was like elevator doors opening up and seeing people I had known from my life who I didn't know had lost the way they had lost and couldn't know until I had lost the way that I lost. And I will do the same the next person who loses someone. I'll say, I'm in the club. I wasn't in the club until I was, you know, 44 years old. And you really were in the club because it hit you so deeply. It was not just an ancillary friend. It was not just somebody who you knew casually, but for some reason, and of course the reason is you loved him dearly, but for some reason, the bobness of it all, like really gut punched you. It gut punched me. Um, he was so there, so there. And we had connected so deeply and it took us years to really get our shorthand Mm -hmm. because I'm a poet in my own way. And he is, has his own beatnik thing, you know? And the first times we would go to dinner, I would be just winded. Because if you don't understand the, the way in which he, his wings fluttered, every time he went to a new thing, you'd pack up all your things conversationally and move to the next topic. And you'd go, okay, I'll come with you here and come with you. And then I started to learn, like, you don't have to, it's, this is all one conversation. He's jamming on all of mm-hmm. it. Love, life any of it he's jamming on it you don't have to uproot everything that's in your mind to go with him to the next place just let him let him paint with this color in this corner of the canvas and then with a different color and just look at the canvas you know and then i started to really understand what he was painting it was like looking at someone's hieroglyphics and then understanding what the language was of it and then i was hooked on it we would just go to dinner and it wasn't, it was just our own thing. And, and I still believe he, there was something about him talking to me that was interesting to him because I wasn't a comic. And comics have a different mind. I wish I had. But you kind of are. In the same way that he's kind of a musician. Yeah. 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 And so we just found this meeting point in the middle that was so be- beautiful and it was abstract, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, cartoonishly abstract it wasn't like indulgently abstract i could just i just knew the once you understand his movements you can you can see them all it's like it's just a language and so i really became to under i i understood that language so well so fluent in bob as mm-hmm. you yeah. were and are it was a, it was a, another language yeah and i was very fluent in it and that was the first time in my life that I was thrust into the world of spirituality out of necessity and thinking about there as opposed to here and that Bob is there and I am here so much so that as I walk through my house for at least a week after he passed away, I felt here in a way that was lonely. I didn't feel here in a way that felt like this is the place to be. I felt here as if it was half of a here and there, as if it was, it was like a long distance relationship. And I just remember walking through my house, feeling as if this had no longer been just my world, but that this was half of a world now. And the other half is there, where, wherever Bob is. And it changed everything. You know, it just, it, even going to get a cup of coffee was, I, I think I've told you, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee, Bob. You know, almost like reporting to him the whole time. You know what? I want to I want to read something that I did a little something for us for today. I went through our last two years of <laughs> text to each other because there were some true nuggets of wisdom in there 
mainly you saying to me, I said a couple of things I was proud of, but you said a lot to me that was just so special and beautiful and interesting. And like you were just saying, there was a whole new world that opened up for you that you hadn't even thought of before. So it went above and beyond just losing Bob mm-hmm. because now there's this whole thing that was a part of your life now that you hadn't even really thought about before. But um, there's a couple nuggets in here that could be some good conversation starters. Uh, this was interesting. You said, um, said, and I had that thought which warmed me over and made me emotional because sometimes I can get wrapped up in the business of grief and sort of lose Bob in the process. And all day I was like, I want the grief to go away so I can just think of Bob because I can't hang with him yet. I can't just be his friend who lost him and thinks of him often and has so many wonderful memories of him because I'm still caught up in the mechanics of grief, Mm. which is so interesting Mm -hmm. because I'm at the point now, two years later, where I can look at these videos and look at these photos and be happy and smile. And in the beginning, you you couldn't, you in general, couldn't do it. No. And, and the mechanics of grief, I realize now, is like someone going through the process of leaving your physical space and entering your heart. And they are gone for a few weeks. Maybe for some people, it's a few months. I don't know when they appear. But when someone's not in front of you anymore, but they're also not in your heart yet in the way they're going to live for the rest of their life in your heart, mm-hmm. you, they, it is crazy. Like it's, they're, the, That level of grief is insane. But they're transitioning up this stairway in your chest to this little place in your heart where they live forever. They're up there. You know, he's in my heart. But there is a moment where he's not in front of me or in my heart. And that was the darkest. You know what I mean? Like on his way to being in my heart, he was nowhere to be found. And that was the darkest. That was the saddest. Once he kind of took residence in my heart, then I felt way better. You know what I mean? Did you feel at all that before he passed that Bob was the guy who, when you lost somebody, was going to help you through it? Yes, he was the rabbi. He was the guy. He was was always Because he lost so many people and he was always telling me, like, don't worry. One day when you lose your parents or when you're going to lose a friend or whoever it is, I'm going to be there for you because I'm the pro. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy who knows what to do. And then it was very disorienting to then lose the guy who's supposed to be the one to help yeah, you through it. But I watched you become the pro. Oh, man. I watched you. Really? Oh, yeah. I watched you. Basically, what Kelly did was get handed The Tonight Show <laughs> and just start hosting The Tonight Show. And she had to walk out, stop and stand on the star, clap her hands together and just start telling the jokes. And what I mean by that is that there is no preparation for it. And you were immediately thrust into this role and you learned as you went and you became a caregiver on day one. You were caring for people. What made me so happy, the thing that brought me joy even on January 9th, and I'm, I know I did it to you too, was the first time I saw you, the first time I saw anybody, was I would say, Bob loved you so much. And that made me so happy to tell people that. And it still makes me so happy. If I'm seeing somebody who I've never met before, like the other day I was at Norman Lear Shiva and I saw this actor that I know Bob loved and thought he was really funny. And this was two years later Mm -hmm. and I've never met this guy. And I said to him, I said, by the way, Bob loved you very much and thought you were hilarious. And he was like, oh my God. Thank you for saying that. For some reason, it really means something when people find out that Bob Saget loved you. Yes. You know? Yeah. He transcended guy who hosted that show with where people get hit in the nuts. One of the hardest things about not having Bob around. I'll tell you a very specific version of what I was going to say. Okay. I went to a a friend's house months back, not very long ago. Sunday night, my friend had hired a magician. And the magician was not very good, which made him very funny. But there was nobody there to highlight that this guy could be really funny about how bad he was, except Bob. And I missed him in a way that was so hard to deal with because I know that if Bob was there, he would have sent these little barbs in 
after everything the, the magician was doing, which would make the magician secondary to the Bob Saget show. And Bob would have crushed this room. And he wasn't there. And I can only, and this is my point, I, can, I know where he would kill, but I can't tell you what he would say. Because he was so dazzling to me that he always caught me off guard. So all I know is that there is a moment in life that comes once every couple of days where I know that if Bob was there, he would catch you off guard and crush. I just can't tell you what it is he would say. And I yeah. hate that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You can feel the rhythm. You, you can, can feel where you're he like, would have, this is where he would, fuck. this is where he would say this. And you'd know it would like the type of joke it would be. Yes. You just can't say exactly what it would be because and even if you could, now you've been thinking about it and he wouldn't have had to think about it I know, because his I just know, I would know. come out in two seconds. That to me is the hardest part of it all. Yeah. Is, as I know that he would have said four words and it would, have, it would have been perfect. I know when, but I don't know what. And I wish I could know what. Have you ever had a time though where there has been something that pops in your head where you're like, I got a Bob joke. And you actually... <laughs> do you say something that you think he would have said? Yeah. And then you're kind of proud of yourself. Like he would have liked so, that. So my, my thing in life is even if you have a thing to say that's outside of your voice, don't say it. Just think mm -hmm. it, remark in your mind because I, I've learned to speak in my voice because mm -hmm. no one knows that that would have been me doing Bob. Right. And unless you're around a bunch of comedians or something, but I've learned the discipline of just because it's funny, it still has to be from you. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. because you have to look, you have to be Bob to get away with some of the Bob stuff. Right. And I've learned that. Or just, if you were with his best friends that's right. or that's his right. kids or something like that. Or around like, him. Right. Because I'm, I'm really good at picking up people's rhythms. I'm a bit of a mimic. Mm -hmm. So then it'd be, it'd be all right in, no, in those moments. But, you know, my brother Carl has this. where I love Carl. Carl is, has a lot of Bob in him, mm -hmm. which is, he, I, I believe that. There was nothing R-rated for Bob because the, the, the twinkle in his eye. He could have said R-rated things and it would still be PG. Dirty words weren't dirty coming from him. Because he meant them in an innocent way. It's a sparkle in his eye. Yeah. And for me, I don't have that sparkle. There's something a little more, I don't know. There's something a little slicker about me so that if I'm dirty, it just sounds like, I don't want to hear you say that. But Bob had a full... I've had full access to, to working blue, but did so like Mr. Rogers. So it was like, so interesting. It, he pulled it off every time. Now this is where I got in trouble. And by, by the way, not just one time, <laughs> a thousand times in my life, I have been intoxicated by watching that happen, either with Bob or my brother, Carl and going, I'm going to land the jump too. And I just can't. And I've learned there's just something in my, and there's not a, there's not this like fun loving twinkle. Maybe I'm like, the more brooding kind of like rock and roll guy. So I can't do it, but it's in me. It's absolutely but you have in your, me. Well, but, and you know this, but you have your own rhythm when it comes to comedy. I have to do and, that. Yeah. And you have found a voice in that world. Remember when you had your show, Current Mood? Current Mood, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything you did on that was so damn Thank hilarious. You. It was so funny. You had a, foam core yeah. board behind you with little yeah. stuffed animals hot <laughs> glue gun to it yes and you had a soundboard oh, with you're making funny, me miss it now funny bring it back yeah with funny uh you know sound, sound effects, effects. <laughs> yeah and it was just so funny and the stories you would tell yeah you had a cvs bag song a <laughs> song about so... cvs yeah i started becoming, it was so I'm, good i'm very observational and I, yeah, the CVS bag thing was funny because when you go away to visit family, <laughs> you just don't have access. You, you think you have access to food in their house and they don't. It's just very much like their food, you know. And then you'll go do a CVS run and then you'll just stockpile a bunch of food that you can have in the guest room. And it's just like cinnamon toast crunch and planters, cashews and stuff and in a one liter bottle of yeah. Diet Coke. And you're just living off that because you realize that you're like, your brother's family is very like, they're very measured with their milk. I'm not. I just rip right through the milk because there's someone's <laughs> right. going to put the milk back in the fridge. For yeah. us, we're LA people. Milk just finds its way back in the refrigerator. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. Carl has Air to go get more milk. That's right.
what would you say, knowing what you know now about this whole new world that you entered into, what was the most helpful thing that people did for you? I came home one time from your house and uh, my assistant had made my bed, but she had never done before. And that broke me, broke me. Wow. It was the littlest thing in the world that said, I know you're hurting. Uh, that's going to break me now. I don't know why. You make the bed. It fucks me up. I, I don't know why. Yeah. Anything like that, that, that says from afar, any, any care given gently from afar messes me up. The little things screw me up. The big things, I get it. I'm ready for the big thing. I, I came back to my room and my bed was made. That messed me up. Kindness can be learned. I love it. I remember where I was. I was a kid. My first record. My manager at the time was like, do you want to send them a bottle of wine? I was like, is that a thing? <laughs> I didn't know it was a thing. And then you learn it. You go, that's a thing. Um, my friend, Mark Hoppus from Blink-182, who was in a cancer battle a couple of years ago, Got a DM from one of our favorite comedians, so I won't say because I don't want to, you know, embarrass him. And it was just saying, hey, man, I'm wishing you all, all, the, all the strength in the world. You got this. And I was like, you can do that? You can write someone you don't know that you admire and give them love? Started doing that. I'm very, we're all very impressionable one way or the other. Yeah. And, and, and to learn kindness and be like, it's almost like a guitar lick. It's like learning a lick. Oh, show me that lick again. Yeah, you just write someone who would know who you were and you reach out and let them know you're a fan or let them know that you're thinking about them. All right, I'm going to play that now. You know, and the more time you spend around people who can play those riffs, the more you can pick up, you know. And so those, those expressions of kindness may not come to me biologically but i love to learn them and then use them again because you just you don't know what's out there until someone else kind shows you what could be done that's so true and, and i have to say I, I i look back on those days at your house i remember each day differently S sunday was the epicenter monday was you're getting an iv and the doctor seeing you or maybe the doctor saw you tuesday and said you needed to rest you're like I think you need to just take a day. And everyone, like let's mm -hmm. let's uh, give you space today. Yeah, and you kind of led the yeah charge let, on that. Let let her sleep. So everyone knew you were sleeping on Tuesday, and everyone came to my house, and we hung at my house. Wanna well, you know what? I had a little bit of FOMO that day. That even though I was in so much pain and so sick at home, I felt bummed that I couldn't be with everybody. Can you I tell know? you something? Mm -hmm. The cutest thing you've ever said to me is, wanna know what? <laughs> wanna know what? I've never heard, I haven't heard that in so long. Wanna know what? And that was, that was the night that Bob had landed back in, in LA as well. That was back when he made it to LA. I have a couple little other nuggets to read you. You don't mind me doing this, do you? I don't mind it at all. No. Okay. Um... This I sent you that week. I don't know, like offhand, I don't know exactly what day, but it was sometime within the first few days. And I said to you, because you were saying some kind things to me, and I said, I don't want to put pressure on you, but sorry, you need to know. Now you're my hero. Of course, not in the exact way how Bob was, but in the way Bob would be proud of. He would also be so fucking happy seeing how you've been with everything and everyone. Wow. And I just remember that, like in those moments, still being like, Thank you, John, for doing what you're doing for everybody. You that, know, you know that's my coping. Is getting again, um, taking care of it is how I how I cope. And then I would come home, and then I would just like, well, you know this. We we usually wipe away tears, but there's sometimes you go, why bother? And you just you just let the track build, like you just get the tear track, and let everything happen inside that one track, and it's actually kind of efficient. To just be crying down the same track of tears. Here's a John thought about crying. You know, let's go. Okay, here's a John thought about crying. Let's go. Uh, I, I wonder if you'll remember this, but this was this was a, a golden nugget. 
You said, I have this theory that we only cry about something once. You can't cry about the same thing twice. It just keeps morphing and changing and new angles will come up. That's why I think if you can take shelter for a bit, take it. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, I don't you remember I, saying that. No, but I understand it. I, I certainly do. I, I, I'm very pragmatic. I'm, I'm, I'm a weird mix of emotional and pragmatic, mm-hmm. which might be why I can be seen as very, as very complicated by others sometimes. But I'm pragmatically emotional or something. I, I can't figure it out. But yeah, I cry. Once I cry about it, I sort of understand it. But grief is so ever changing that then I would cry about a new angle. And then there was a moment where I would miss crying and then I would cry again and I would go, I remember we talked about oh, that. Oh, good, good, good. I mean, I'm so self conscious that even in the grips of grief, I start wondering, I haven't cried in like four hours. Am I a psychopath? Yeah. You know, you or start- am I, does this mean I don't care anymore? Exactly. Remember, I was having this problem with you, or I mean, not problem with you. I was, having this problem and talking to you like, John, I didn't cry today. Is that bad? And I'm like, does that, are people going to judge me? Yeah. Or, it's very, it's a very self-conscious conscious thing. And something that I started struggling with several months later, and you and I talked about this a lot, when I started to have moments of levity and have mm-hmm. moments of happiness, that I felt guilty for being happy. And you said to me, you said, you'll have so many more dances with sadness. You don't have to worry about making the most of being happy. Mm-hmm. And you have. You, know? you had. At that. I mean, that's, you had more dances with sadness after that. Oh, yeah. Because it's funny. You think that when you're feeling a little better, you're like, oh, I'm just better now. And you yeah, forget that you're, you know, <laughs> it's, the wave yeah. is going to come crash yeah. over you again. Where are you now in the frequency of the waves? How, uh, how often do the waves hit? Do they hit harder this time of year? I would imagine they um, do. Probably. I would say that there were the first six months I didn't miss one day of crying. Mm -hmm. I cried every single day for at least six months. And then maybe it was I'd miss a day each week (laughs) for the the next six months. And then the second year, now maybe I'll cry a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not all the time. You mean now you might cry a couple times a week? Yeah, or... Maybe once a week, you know, it's not uh, anywhere near as frequent, but because I'm able, I still think about Bob as much, but it's in a happy way. I'm able to now look at those videos and look at those photos and have the thoughts and the memories and smile and have happy thoughts about it versus feeling like the gut punch every single time. I still get the gut punch. I saw a video the other day. I watched one of his podcasts where he had Rabbi Leader on and he was talking about grief and Bob was giving advice on how to help people grieving. And I had never seen it before. And it was this really crazy perspective Mm -hmm. of, wait a second. It put me back to this whole, he's my guy that's supposed to help me through this. Why isn't he here? And it's really weird to hear his advice on how to help people grieving when he's the one that's it's giving, gone. Yeah, he's giving you advice on, on how and to grieve him. It gutted me. I just yeah. started bawling. And did and you then, like that you had cried? Did you did, did it feel good to bawl that much after a long time of not crying? It did. And then once again, you know, when when you get it out, you feel better after. And you're like, yeah. oh my god, that actually felt yeah. good to get out. But then he said a weird thing in it. He said. I, uh, one of the things that always helped me was comfort food. And so he brought up comfort food. And then it was this little, almost like pat on the back validation of that he'd be supporting what I'm doing right now. Oh, he absolutely would be. And it made me so happy that I'm like, oh, good. He would, he would agree with this. Yes. I would have said yes to you out, out of wanting to do it. And he would have said nervously, thank you for doing it as if it were a favor and I'd be like, no, I really want to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, this was, I will say this was one thing that when I asked you to do it originally, you said, you're like, well, I'll be your first guest. I'll be the first one. And when you said that, I was like, okay, I don't feel like I'm asking him for a favor. I really feel like he would want to have these conversations. There's a camera, there's microphones. This is an idea. Mm-hmm. Everyone just has an idea for the thing they want to do. 
It's that natural to me. If I don't know you, it might be fun to, to, to live in your idea, but I don't see this world of entertainment as like, show me what it is they do. How many viewers do they have? It's just, who do I know? And whose world do I want to visit? And I do not, I, probably mostly for better and less for worse, I am where I am in my career because I go, I like that person. I want to talk to that person. I'm not very strategic. I'm very strategic in the way that I want to present myself, yeah. but I'm not strategic in terms of like playing chess with other people. If I know you, if I love you, I want to do your thing. I don't look at it like, show me who the biggest name is and let me go do their thing. If like, yeah. like when I did call her daddy last year, I had, I had, I had dinner with Alex Cooper and I liked her and I went, okay, I'll do it because I only want to do things out of that heart thing. I'll come to your premiere, but I will not go to the premiere if I don't know who you are. And I don't know if I have so no connection. So it could be a huge name, but if you don't know and love them, then it's not on your radar to, it's something you want to do. Right. Because I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. Right. And I, I, that's how you should be doing stuff. I promise right. you. I'm in like year 23 of this or whatever. And this is all that matters to me is I'll do your thing. I, I, I will, I'll join your world and be in your idea. Like this is your, this is, this is the embodiment of your idea. I want to come, I want to come play in your world. And I think it's also a, a great, I, I think ostensibly it's a great idea for a show. I worry, is there something maybe f that might become fatiguing about visiting grief once a week? Or is it, or do you think it might be just the opposite? Well, a lot of the conversations don't always revolve around grief because not everybody's even, like, for instance, I had Jojo Siwa on. We mm -hmm. talked, she's never lost anyone in her life, but she's gone through some things, even for a 20 year old. She has an interesting perspective to talk about just difficult times. Right. And so some people have maybe been through, you know, an addiction. Some people have been through a divorce. Some people right. have gone through something where it's not always grief. It's not the grief of loss it's, all the time. It's oh, just, or the loss of life. It's let's talk about this time in your life that was difficult, but let's do it in a way that brings a little light to it, a little levity to it. Let's have some comfort food to make it a little cozier for mm -hmm. you. So that's the point versus why I wanted to have you on Yes, we're talking a lot about the grief thing because you had such a unique and dare I say brilliant perspective on this whole world because you had never been in it before and you were fascinated by this new world that you were in. And as we called it, this new universe. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're like, this is a whole weird new universe. That's that an interesting in. word you say fascinated because I think I was. It was, it was an entire encyclopedia of information dropped in front of you all at once. Yeah. And it goes, learn this now. And <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, I have to, so I will. And it was, it really was like a third eye opening up and you go, Oh, there's this other level to the world at all times. And it's lost. Yeah. Yeah. It's lost. So you and I are focusing on this more because you have something very special to bring to the table in terms of not only do people go through this in life, but you were able to vocalize things in such a way and, mm. you know, put it on paper mm. and actually get these thoughts out that most people can't ever form these thoughts and be able to transmit them. And you were so eloquent in being able to transmit these thoughts about grief. I can, I, I am lucky that I can witness something. I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm not really a mystery to myself. I can feel everything that's going on and I can report pretty quickly on it. Mm -hmm. And I was really reporting. All those texts are just me reporting in real time. Yeah. Like, oh, it seems to me that blah, blah, blah. What's really happening is blah, blah, blah. And did you ever feel those moments where you hate that you accepted because you, you always wanted to never accept? And then you go, I remember like in my case, I went, I remember the night I went, yeah, I know you're gone. Yeah, For I me, I know that day that was his funeral when I actually saw him. Yeah. And I remember you were one of the people who weighed in. Uh, and I actually. We're going to the phones. Oh, we're going to the phones. This was, this was, uh, this was a little heavy, but it was important because this is life. Um, I was wrestling with whether or not I should see him before. Do you remember that? 
Tell me. Because I, I forgot what I said, I but I remember. I was wrestling with it because I was scared that if I saw him, that that would be like the last image I had of him. I think I know what I said, but <laughs> go, to the, <laughs> go to the transcript. <laughs> the transcript is, you said, a thought to share as you decide whether or not you want to see him. Also weigh it from the angle of what you would regret more not doing once it's all over. It's a calculus I do sometimes. Not which one you want to do more, but which decision would you have regretted less? Yeah. That's what I thought I said. And that's so, what I would have said now. Is That's what I did. And I saw him because I didn't want to regret it. And that was the moment that I was like, okay, this isn't a joke. He's not just on yeah, tour. He's yeah. not, he's like, this is real. Yeah. I, I, I remember seeing the lid close at the burial. Mm, you were a pallbearer. I was a pallbearer. And I remember the handprints, my own, you know, fingerprints on the gloss of the, of the, you know, it was like a, a, a casket. Mm -hmm. And they put it into this white box that then that goes into the ground. And I'll never forget watching the top slide and the sliver. But what was once this entire view of this beautiful gloss in um, lacquered coffin and this white top going over it and me just holding, it was almost like holding onto every split second of that pie as it got smaller and smaller of the brown of the wood. I just remember watching it until there was no more like a sun going down under the horizon and watching the white cover it up and go like, that's remember that. like grabbing on with my eyes. That was. That was the sun going down over the horizon. And that's where loss begins. When there's no more things to do. There, was no, there were no more, no more things physical to do. thing to touch. Yeah. You I know? Mean, that's the, that's the, the, the tricky part about death is that they, you actually get, a, you get some freebies after someone dies. You get a freebie. And the freebie is they're not totally gone because you have things to do in their name. And when you complete those things to do in their name, that is when it's ripped out of your hands. Because... We had this great ability to hang, this opportunity, I should say, to hang with each other. We hung in your closet, went through stuff. And I'll never forget some of these memories. These memories are like Thanksgivings to me. We had yeah. six Thanksgivings in a row in one week. And then at some point, the gang ain't getting back together again. You know, it was weird how you missed that time. I missed it. I miss yeah. it. I miss it. You can't get that back to where you would walk in the kitchen and there's everyone in your life right there. And people don't get together anymore that way because someone's got a film to do in, in Europe. Someone's on a tour. But this death when you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s, I'm sure, is the last thing that gets people together with that, that, you know, that real sell of we've got to get you. And you know, you're drawn back to this group of people. And the bittersweet part of it is that you'll never have a Thanksgiving with that cast, although no. you should, it'd be really fun. I mean, even from night one, when everybody started to show up at your quite house. Quite a cast, quite a, I'm so grateful for that time though, because once again, to bring the comedy into it is when you lose someone who's a comedian and you're surrounded by other comedians, it, it does help a little bit. You know, having yeah. Jeff Ross there, having Bill Burr there that we, I mean, having certain people who can at the appropriate time say the right thing that you know that oh, Bob would have appreciated that joke. They're, they're you know? medicine men. They're medicine men. Case in point, Dave Chappelle at the comedy store oh, oh, in thank, the belly Thank God room. for him that week too, yeah. When it was maybe the second week and you weren't there, you were still home. You would, you would emerge a week later for Mike Binder's thing. And Dave went on stage and I've never seen him like that before. He was, he was a healer. It was unbelievable. People who hadn't laughed in two weeks were crying with laughter and he knew what it took to do it, which was just so funny and so silly. If you grow up with brothers and there's some unrest between one of your brothers and a parent or both of your parent, both your parents, you'll start to understand there's this way of compensating for loss or pain. Really, when you're growing up, it's pain. Uh, where one of your brothers just gets really funny did you have this with your sister? If, if, if your parents were fighting or something, like, everyone kind of knows the balance of when to be funny to make mm -hmm. the other person laugh. It's like Dave knew that was all on his shoulders and just destroyed. Yeah. It was so, so funny. And it not in funny his normal at the way. Funeral yeah. The night before yeah. when he, you know, got up and was talking at the funeral and 
that was maybe the first time I somewhat laughed. I mean, because that was a horrible day, but that brought a little bit of levity to it. And then the first time I had a belly laugh was the night of the comedy store that we did that tribute. Yeah. I remember Jim Carrey saying to you when you got on stage, wiping tears away from your eyes, opening up your laser printed pieces of sheets of paper and the whole room was quiet. Jim goes, make it quick. Yeah. He's like, so, he's like, keep it short. Yeah. Keep it short. He goes, keep and, it short. <laughs> and I was like, well, keep in mind, I didn't even know necessarily that I was going to go up on stage that day. Mike Binder's like, you need to say something. And then I look on stage and it was you, Stamos, Jeff Ross. That would be intimidating in and of itself just for anybody to be on stage with the three of you. But because I love you so much and I knew that you guys would be supportive of me. I felt comfortable having mm -hmm. you guys behind me. But then all of a sudden I see that it's Jim Carrey and Chris Rock on stage too. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be on stage at the comedy store in front of, or literally in front of, because they were sitting five feet behind yeah. me, Jim Carrey and Chris Rock. And am I supposed to say a joke? Am I supposed to be funny? What am I doing up here? And it was the most intimidating moment of my life. But that's why I was so grateful that I had you and Jeff behind me because I'm like, all right, at least, at least they're here. You know what? It was like my touchstone. You were allowed to say anything or feel anything. Yeah. You were absolutely allowed. I did, I did a tight two. <laughs> you never hear a tight two. <laughs> yeah. I did a tight two it and It might half. have felt like two. I bet you it was eight. Who knows? No, you I, know. think, I, think, I think I think it was two. You maybe, know it was two? Maybe three. Okay. You had a word count did going it, on. I did a tight two okay. and a half. Okay. okay. I'm glad I did it though. It was yeah. one of those things that I knew Bob would have wanted me to do and he would have given me a hug after and been like, you did it. You know, good job, honey. You did it. I picked a song to play in the car on the way from the, from the temple to the site the day that, uh, of Bob's funeral. And I thought about setting it up on my channel. Maybe I will after I tell you this. I never told anyone this. Just, just the guy driving me. <laughs> I wanted to hear a song on the way, which is a, Two-minute drive to go from having the service to the burial. And I picked the acoustic demo version of Bruce Springsteen, Growing Up. I knew it was going to be a Bruce song. And you got to understand that song for me is like, he's rapping the whole time. And it's like, and then he goes, ooh, growing up. And that's the hook. And it's like, you get all of this information, this rat-a-tat information, just to get, ooh, growing up. And I listened to it on the way. I just lost it. But I, lo I lost it to that. And, and uh, maybe I'll, from this point forward, maybe I'll do one of those little tributes to Bob before that plays on the channel, because it does play sometimes. And it plays because that's the song I picked. And it was perfect for that moment. It was perfect for that moment. And he, he loved Bruce Springsteen. And I think it was his love of like songwriting that turned me on even more to wanting to write songs that he dug. Like he, he loved songs that like are the least performing of mine on Spotify, but he liked what it was about. The same thing that made them not perform very well in any commercial way, like was up his alley, you know? And uh, like I have a song called Badge and Gun, which you have, to, it's, it might be in the bottom three of songs people know. Which is Weird to me, but Bob loved he it. He loved that song. And a little uh, private moment when I went to your show in Florida, you played Badge and Gun. And because you said, or no, no, it wasn't that show. It was a show within a couple days of that show. Because one of my friends sent me a video of you playing Badge and Gun. Uh -huh. And you said, this goes out to my friend Bob. Uh -huh. And you played it for him. And every once in a while, you'll still dedicate that song oh, to yeah. him, which is yeah. so beautiful because he loved that song so much. You know... I think you played it at um, Full Comedy, la the last yes, one. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. I did it. I, did I do it there? You would remember. I was, I was just trying to make you double over. <laughs> I know. Right. You're like um, laser beams yes, right, right know, at me. Yes, I know, I know. You're, you're kind of fun to watch. Because <laughs> you know you're doing something. You know you're hitting the nerve if, if, if you can cry. Yeah. You know, if, I've, if Kelly cries, you know you've hit a nerve. <laughs> There's, there, you know how people talk about what separates humans from animals and most of it is consciousness and opposable thumbs, you know? Like, the, 
the human ability to remember one another is to me one of the great gifts of being a human being. And not letting someone be forgotten is part of the magic of consciousness that we're somehow graced with as human beings. Remembering people. It's the best. It's the best. And, and there's nothing... I would have thought before I lost Bob, before we lost Bob, that uh, anyone still talking about someone they lost two, three, four, five years in the future just were, just were harping on it. You know? I get over it. Right. There's just one. Oh, you've, you've said your piece. To continually remember someone is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. When I get to tell stories about Bob to someone who didn't know Bob, what a gift. Right. What a gift. You know, there's that one intersection. I keep telling the story. Anyone who's ever in the car with me, when I go through that intersection that's shaped like a star, it's like six different roads. Like Beverly off of Sunset. Off of, off of Sunset when it goes to Beverly right before, you know, you go south into Santa Monica or whatever. Where'd you get south into Santa Monica and get out of here? <laughs> Just take Beverly right off of Crescent. What are you doing What are you here? doing here? And Bob used to say, because it's just chaos every time. You can't tell, who, you know, there's just no right of way. And he says the nicest car gets to go first. Yield yeah. to the nicest car. I will tell people who didn't know Bob, you know, my friend Bob used to say. And these are the things in life that make life really rich. I will tell my kids about him. I wrote that the night I came home and put it in the, in the caption. I said, I'll tell my kids about you. And I love saying to people, you know, my friend Bob used to say, it's great. It's great. And you never have to stop. It's not harping on it. So I will probably pick up a guitar and say, this was tonight. I'm thinking about my friend Bob tonight. I'm going to play this song for him. You know? And, and it's, one of the, it's one of the few things that make being a human being a little more tolerable than what looks to be really fun to be like an animal or something, not have to deal with some of this shit, but we get to remember each other. Well, I think if that's not the best lesson from all of this, then I don't know what is yeah. because thank you for saying that because you do kind of feel like when you become the person who lost somebody and you're still talking about your person, like, is it too much? Am I talking about no. him too much? You know, and, what I've learned is that there really isn't too much, especially with somebody. I mean, of course, everyone is loved by their people the way that Bob is loved by us. But there was just something about Bob that just still resonates. And, oh, yeah. and I'm just so grateful to you for being that person that, and who will always continue to share him. And it means, and I don't even need to tell you to do that because you do it on your own. But it's obviously what I feel is a big purpose of mine going forward is to always share him and keep him top of mind because he deserves that. Yeah. He's, he's that guy that just, he should still be here. And so if he's not, we're going to keep sharing him. That's right. And we'll all be gone someday. Yeah. All this love will be gone. You, we, it will be gone. The, the, not, just the, not just Bob, but people remembering Bob right. will be gone. And Bob, in a lot of ways, was the last connective tissue between those who had been gone for years and those yeah. who were just clamoring for any information you could get about people. He was the last student of those giants. You know? It's all going to be gone at some point. What a gift to be able to keep someone in the gang by yeah. talking about them, singing songs about them. It's like really beautiful. It's tough every time I set off on a new project and he, he doesn't know about it. I remember you said that That's one time. Hard. You said that uh, about your show, that your tour, not this tour, the tour before yeah. that, where you had the big neon. Yeah, with Bob. I put a I put a picture of Bob. And his. you said it just really makes me sad that he's not getting to see this run. That's he didn't know that it. I did yeah. a solo tour. Yeah. He would have loved the solo tour, and he would have loved. He would have given me some insight about it that would have made me feel really good and encouraged that only he could have could have given me. These are the people who like really matter in our lives. Like everyone matters, but the people who really make an impact are the people who you cannot speak to yourself in their voice. You have to talk to them. You know, yeah. you can only imagine what they'd have to say. Some people are predictable, you know, 
Bob, Bob's, Bob wasn't like a, you got this guy. He wouldn't just be like, you got this. He would break it down. And he, just the number of times I would have been surprised by something he would have said in the, in the past two years. Well, that, ultimately, that's, what he would be so happy about, and you know this, is all the things that you've done for him, for me, for his memory. He'd be like, wow. John really loves me. You're talking about the Bob Saget School for Gifted Children that opened in <laughs> Las Vegas, right outside of Las Vegas in Henderson, Nevada. I believe that's what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> hey, I also... <laughs> I, yes, I'm talking about that. Wouldn't that be that. funny? Open up the Bob Saget School for Gifted Children. For children who can't laugh good? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't let this conversation taper without... Mentioning Jeff Ross, who was sort of as powerful in this as anyone was. Um, he, he has like the, the calmest touch, the most yeah. love, the, just the calmest touch on things. He can be sad and he can also go, hey, buddy, how you doing? Buddy? And so I can't have, I can't let this conversation come and go without mentioning he really, Jeff. He really gets this world. He, Jeff was my partner in crime on this. Jeff and I would consult. What do you think we should do? When do you think we should pick up Bob's car? We should do that. And Jeff would go, Jeff had that other side of getting things taken care of. When you picked up that car, man, the two of you guys together, that just broke me, but in a beautiful way. Because, I mean, I know it broke you guys too. It was very dark, but also very beautiful. We had a license plate and a, and a model of a car. <laughs> at, and, and we had a terminal that he was parked at, probably. And we would walk around every floor of this garage looking for Bob. Where are you, Bob? Come on, Bob. Where Where's the 2006 Prius Where's that was his airport car? car? Uh-huh. And these are these things that are so beautiful and you wish they never happened at the same time. They're beautiful and they're terrible. But we find the beauty in these things. And Jeff and I, with this old Prius key that I, it turned out not to even work. Oh, God. And thank God there was like the real key hiding inside of the remote one. Mm -hmm. And we got the car. And like, we had been sad for days. And we're rejoicing that we had found the car. Yeah. Right? Like, there's a laugh inside of the yeah. tears of all this. And then having to explain to the person, you know, with the exit gate who needed the ticket. And I think they said like, well, that'll be like 600 some dollars or something. I know, I felt so and It was like, well, I don't think you understand. Like, and I think we just went for it. Anyway. I think I just gave him the card anyway and was like, if you only knew. Right, like this is Bob's You wouldn't card. have charged. I, yeah. I think someone up, up on, and Jeff might be able to tell you more about it. I don't know if that, that was refunded or something was done, but I just remember, <laughs> okay, listen. I mean, you should be able to get your car out for free yeah. if these are the circumstances. LAX Terminal 7 parking. Yeah. Is that where it was? Mm -hmm. We just, we, when we started United. thinking like him, if you're Bob, don't you think you're on the floor closest to the, to the actual check-in itself? He was an efficient man. And he and I were like, we we're like Columbo. <laughs> and I knew exactly where it was because I knew we parked in the same place all the time, but I probably wasn't capable of even relaying that information so to you guys funny. at the time. Bob was about efficiency. So we would have parked close to where he could have taken the fewest steps to be able to check in. Uh-huh. We had so, I mean, we had fun inside of a really, really dark moment. But then well, you, you know, begin, he appreciated that. Very uh, he much. was with us the whole time. Yeah. He was with us the whole time and, and still is, you know, like I said, they're only gone in between the time they leave this world and show up in your heart. And it's a journey. You know, it's a journey. And once they end up in your heart, you go, got it. There you are. And you cry less. And you celebrate more and you smile more and you represent them more. You can make it deeper into a conversation longer without crying. You still hit a couple things. You know, it's the little things now that crush me. Yeah. The little things. The big things we worked on. Yeah. It's the, it's like me leaving. We were all in your closet, you know, looking through stuff. And on the way out of the bedroom, I saw a guitar and I tuned it. Put it back on the stage. Oh, you did. Just tuned it. I don't know for who. For him. I'll tune the guitar. That stuff kills me. I'm a yeah. details guy. The big thing, loss, I'll take care of it. Going like I want to tune his guitar. I tuned it. 
put it back on the stand, walked out of the bedroom. Knowing Why? That he, knowing that he would have been like, thanks, John. Just wanted to tune it. Those things, that's what makes every, you know, there's a lot of humanity left in people. I'll, I'll put it that way. It may not always be at the, the surface level, but there's a lot of humanity left in people. And, and those are the moments I think that you witness it and hold on to it and go, we're still loving people. You know, everyone who writes bullshit on the internet still has a picture of their dog somewhere on their Instagram. And they write, he's my wuffy little baby. <laughs> He's my whoopy, love you, baby, baby. Well, you know, somewhere else in their <laughs> social media profile, they're ripping someone apart. Yeah. We're all capable of that kind of humanity. And, the and, dichotomy. Yeah, and it was just humanity lessons and all this, you know, with all this. Well, but, how lucky am I that you were my partner in crime throughout all of this? And as I told you, and I know you get a little humble about it, but I'm just forever grateful for everything you've done and will continue to do. And that I had this newbie, fellow newbie on the grief journey with me that we both went through it at the same time and in such a huge way and learned so much. And hopefully I was there for you as much as you were there for me. Uh, you, you know, I know you're trying to wrap up, but I oh, must please. say, I must say <laughs> about, please, about yeah. you that you were thrust into a role that you were not prepared for and were not emotionally prepared for. No. And really became a master of understanding loss and caring for people during loss. Uh, I know you're not like a kid person, right? I mean, is that... Is, is that That's the most accurate thing. Right, so this doesn't get edited say. out right. if I say you're not a kid person. But your maternal instincts really or came. I'm not a baby. Let's say I'm not a, a small kid. But person. Like, yeah. like you have no plans. Yeah, like I don't, have, right, right, right. You, you have no yeah. plans to have kids. Right. But I would say that your yeah. maternal caring instincts were on full display while you were also handling one of the most tragic losses at the same time. To suffer and care at the same time, I would think is one of the most maternal instincts in the world. So that is, that is really unbelievable. And I watched you do it. I watched you figure it out and become um, someone who could console others while you were also suffering, which was brilliant and beautiful. And, and, and that's why I love you. Oh, thank you. I mean, I don't, don't even know what to say to that. So thank you because that's, really just a testament to wanting to do good for him, you know, yeah. and to make him proud too, because me wanting to care for other people was just me doing what I know he would have done, you know? Well, you can only thank fake you. it for so long. So at this well, point, this is you, this is you, you now, you know, you, thank you, like I said, kindness is you pick it up. So maybe at the beginning, you were doing Bob. You were doing, a, doing like a, what he would have done. But now this is what you will do. You know? Well, not, and it's, it's one of those things that if we can now, when somebody else goes through it, now I could help somebody else go through it, then This is the university right. of loss. You're, you're a graduate. I'm a graduate not the way you are. I mean, you, you really are a graduate of this particular one. You got you got your undergrad. I got my master's. You got your yeah, master's. Okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'm so dumb. Not a PhD. I can't even, I can't Other even people, make... Other people, Bob had his PhD. Yes. Jeff had his PhD. Yes. You know. Yeah. And this is a really great show, podcast experience. I normally get in the car afterwards and go into a flat spin. And I won't because this was really beautiful. Thank you, John. Well, I love you very much. And well, thank you for you being here. And now that we're done talking, we're going to have some eggplant parm. Is there really eggplant parm in yes. the deal? Yes. Just in time. Just in time. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. This was such a special episode for me. And I'm so happy that all of you now get to see the side of John that I've known for years. He was so, so helpful to me when I needed him most. And I'm just so grateful he got to be on the show today. So thanks for listening. Comfort Food is produced by Wheelhouse DNA for Acast. 
Our executive producers are Fanny Baudry, Cassie Berman, Leah Sutherland, and yours truly, Kelly Rizzo. Our audio producer is Chiara Noni. Special thanks to Camila Goldenberg and Riley Oval rank for production assistance. Our audio engineer is Matthew Blocka. Our editor is Nick Karismi. This podcast is hosted by me, Kelly Rizzo. If you like the show, please rate us five stars and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in.